Hey everybody, Jim Ingersoll here hanging out with um, my new friend Ryan Mellon. We met on our way to Cuba last month on a cruise and I really had the pleasure of getting to know Ryan and he has an amazing story about the way he carves out his life, his lifestyle. Um, he uses real estate to support the lifestyle of his dreams is what I'm trying to say. And he does that in an amazing way, in a very unique uh, way that you're going to absolutely love learning from him because he's living life to the fullest and he's doing it with a big smile on his face. He comes to us from beautiful Hampton Roads, Virginia when he's home, but he's traveling all the time. Hey, I want to thank everybody for the likes, the reactions, the shares, and the comments. Leave us your comments whether you're listening in YouTube, whether you're on my website, or whether you're in iTunes, just leave a review. We greatly appreciate everybody in our success um, listeners. You guys are awesome. So Ryan, welcome to Real Estate Success. Thanks, Jim. I appreciate you having me. All right. So Ryan Mellon, you're a young man, but like, where did you grow up? And like, what's sort of your backstory here? Where did it start for you? So I grew up in Newport News. Uh -huh. uh, I was working in my 20s. I was working um, as a restaurant manager during the day. Wow. And in the evenings, I was working for UPS. I was part-time supervisor for UPS in the evenings. So I was working anywhere from 12 to 16 hour days um, for quite a long time. I think I did two jobs for 10 years. Wow. Um, eventually, I was always intrigued by real estate. I always thought I wanted to get in somehow and do something in real estate, and I wasn't quite sure exactly what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. so I started with just reading some of the forums online and reading books, um, get my bearings and getting interested in and trying to figure out what exactly I liked in real estate. Um, what were some of those like early books and um, websites and stuff you were reading and learning from? Do you remember any of them that made an impact? I think the biggest one was Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which is kind of like a number one for everybody. Yeah, it was for me. And I read some of his follow-up books on multifamilies and rentals. Um, and I think the really the biggest impact that it's not a real estate book, mm -hmm. but it's an entrepreneur. And it, it what really played the biggest role for me was the four-hour work week. I knew it. <laughs> yeah, that was, it's huge. That's a huge, uh, that was a game changer for me because I read that. And then, um, when I was working two jobs, I was able to carve out two whole weeks. You know, after I read that book, I was really amped on, like, I just want to maybe get out there and do some solo travel like he talks about in the book. So I, I was able to carve out two weeks and I jumped on a plane by myself and I flew down to Costa Rica and I had an amazing time. I went to five or six spots in those two weeks, you know, just getting around on chicken buses, backpacking it, doing it cheap, staying in hostels. And that totally changed everything for me. When I got back to work, you know, usually you come back from vacation, you're supposed to be refreshed and ready to go. <laughs> I wasn't. I got back to work and I was just so ready to make some major changes so that I could keep traveling like this as much as possible. So <clears throat> I think the four hour work week uh, really does that to a lot of people. It's a big book. Um, and there's a lot in there about it's the first time I ever heard about virtual assistants. You know, he talks about traveling, uh, how to pack minimally and how to stay in an area long enough. So you feel like you're a local yeah. I, yeah, I read it a long time ago, but I still remember these things, right? Yeah. And and it did. It had an impact on me as well as far as like creating freedom. I could see you like working those two jobs, reading that book, and then reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad, thinking it's time to make some changes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'm so glad I read that book, book hot, and I'd probably still be doing the same thing I was, you know, five years ago. Yeah, books can... Books can dramatically change the future of people's lives is, is a really key takeaway. And those are two really good ones. I agree. 
So, <clears throat> so then you began, you went to Costa Rica. I've been to Costa Rica as well. We both traveled a lot, but not me as much as you. And uh, I loved Costa Rica also. I really want to go back. It's just like, I went with my family, but it was an amazing time with sloths and monkeys and, you know, yeah. the ocean and the river and the volcano. And yeah. So it's on my list to go back to. Um, and what year did you go to Costa Rica? How long ago? Nope. That was uh, March of 2016. Okay, so March of 2016, three years ago. Yeah. And, and you go to Costa Rica, two weeks, you come back, and did you go back to those two jobs? or what did Yeah, you I went back to those two jobs. I wasn't happy about it, but I kind of just, just fell back into the same old, same old for about mm -hmm. another year or six months or so I would say maybe six months and then what happened was you know I was hanging out having a few drinks with a couple good friends of mine and they were talking about how one day they want to retire when they retire they want to travel the U.S. in an RV and just do a big road trip and I had just come off this awesome Costa Rica trip you know six months previous and that kind of got me sparked a fire back in and me um and i was just like you know why are we waiting why are we waiting till retirement like we all could manage this now if we really wanted to so the game plan was just let's save up as much money as we can we'll quit our jobs we're gonna hit the road and get out there for a year um we set a date of october 2017 that's when we were gonna quit and and leave and we hit that goal we hit that goal. We went, we got on the road maybe two weeks late because I had just purchased a, a new duplex, a rental property. And um, we were in there trying to get it ready and rented right before I mm -hmm. left for a year. But we, we made our date. So October 2017. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> how did you do that? Like, how did you put pieces together so that you could quit two jobs that were working you to death and you had zero freedom so you could have total freedom and really do whatever you want with your life but like, what were some of the key things that you did in case one of our listeners is thinking man I'm tired of working 60 70 yeah. hours a week too I would love to go take some trips and go travel the world yeah well absolutely it it worked out kind of organically um it, the game plan uh, the initial game plan was let's just have enough money saved up that we don't have to work for that whole year. We can be on this road trip and worst case scenario, all of us could have came back to our, our same jobs. I have been doing some real estate stuff on the side. And so basically what happened was I had bought my first rental duplex. Um, that had, we got that up and running and cash flowing while I was on the road. I rented out my primary residence with a one year lease because I was going to be gone too. We had all downsized as far as getting rid of a lot of stuff, canceling bills that we didn't need, just reducing all of our expenses so that really we had just what we were spending on the road. We didn't have any, we didn't have to pay our mortgages while we were gone or our power bills or water bills. So that made a huge impact. And then, the real estate kind of morphed while I was on the road a bit as well. You know, I have my real estate license. Um, I ended up teaming up with an agent in my office and she was the boots on the ground and I was working a lot of the paperwork side of things. Um, just making sure all the contracts got through and everything got to closing. And we really just started building this machine while I was on that one year road trip. Um, and I think we did somewhere between 20 and 25 deals that year on the road trip, um, my first road trip. So. so doing deals while on vacation, I yeah. love it. <clears throat> yeah. Love it on so many levels. I mean, I've been doing this a long time, Ryan, and I still remember like I struggled really bad like everybody else. And I started doing this part time while I was working. And I remember like we went to California and I was sitting on the beach in California and I was working on wholesaling a house before I left. And all of a sudden I did a contract from the hotel while I was on vacation on the beach. And I thought, 
this is like too good to be true, right? <laughs> it's like I can really do this. And you, so yeah. you created like a backpack business and Absolutely. did 20, 25 deals um, in that first year. Let's talk about where you went during that first year and then come back to like how you did that. Like that first year of travel, where did you guys go? Yeah. So it was uh, one year. We did, we ended up doing 23 states. So we started in my home state of Virginia and we went south. Uh, you know, through all the southern states, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, down to Florida. Our, bur our first major destination was the Keys. So we were in the Florida Keys for Thanksgiving, uh, cooked a big Thanksgiving dinner in the RV, and then hung out by the pool the rest of the day, yeah. which, which was quite weird because, you know, normally in Virginia or I have family in Pennsylvania when I'm at that Thanksgiving, it's freezing cold outside and you're inside in front of the TV. So it was a totally different type of Thanksgiving for us. Uh, after that, we, we snaked our way back up out of Florida and followed the most Southern route all the way to California. We were trying to stay in, in the warmer weather during the winter. Um, which worked out for the most part. We did get snowed on in Texas and in the Grand Canyon, we got snowed on. Um, but other than that, we stayed in pretty fair weather. Um, we spent about two months in California, one month in Oregon. We really enjoyed the West Coast and just how natural and beautiful that was. A lot of the uh, national parks and stuff. We went up to Washington State and then kind of through Idaho, uh, Montana, uh, Colorado, and just back to Virginia. A year later. Yeah. <clears throat> so did you, did, you, did you come home at all in between that to like check your mail or anything? Or how did you handle all yeah, that? Yeah, I was home three months uh, in between that and um, got some things together, actually bought another rental property um did a renovation there got it rented out um and did some more deals some wholesale deals and just working doing some agent work mm -hmm. uh, and then i left for my six months abroad um december of 2017 18 okay all right so let's talk about like when you started to connect dots and you're like all right, I'm, I'm going all over the country. I'm having an awesome time in Key West and a month in California. And all of a sudden you're starting to put, to create deal flow from your RV. Yeah. Like how did you, how did the first one come about and how did it feel as you started to figure all the, you know, connect all the dots on that? Yeah. So before I left, I made sure that I was going to be able to wholesale deals while I was gone. I had already been wholesaling some deals before I left. So I had a good feel for it. Um, I got a, a buddy of mine who also worked for me at UPS. I showed him the ropes as far as how to meet with a seller, go out there, take pictures and videos of the house. And so if I was able to when I was on the road, I would still be searching Craigslist and sending out mailers and whatever I could do to get uh, a motivated seller on the phone. And I would let him know, hey, I'm out of town. I wouldn't give him really any more specifics than that. Uh, like, currently out of town. Could I send one of my partners by to check out the house? So he would go by, meet with the seller, take all the pictures, upload them in Dropbox for me. And then I would just negotiate the seller over the phone. Um, we, I had my all in one scanner printer with me if I had to do some print and scanning, that type of stuff. But because I'm an agent as well, I had access to do, sending them out for digital signatures as well. So that worked out pretty well, even, um, on the wholesale side of things. And, um, and then just would forward, forward everything to my buyers back in Virginia, um, which, I only really have one buyer, that's Lori Eubanks, and uh, mm -hmm. she does, she pretty much buys anything I have. We do a lot of business together, and uh, she's really helped me with my business. Um, and we've helped each other out quite a I bit. Love that. Of course, Lori's been on our show before. She's a friend of mine. I love watching her investing career go like this. So that is awesome. So you start <clears throat> wholesaling from the road, you're doing cold calling you know, for sale by owners, all that stuff. 
you get them on the phone, they're motivated, you send a friend of yours out there, takes pictures, meets the seller, builds rapport, uploads them, and then you call them back and you're like, I'm gonna close this thing. Absolutely. And yeah. then you send it out electronically for signature to the seller, you receive it back, you call Lori up, who's on your buyer's list, and say, Lori, I've got a great deal in Hampton, Virginia. Um, here's all the information on it. She goes and takes a look. You send her an assignment, and you're, you just sit back to collect a check, right? That's right. Absolutely. I mean, I, I don't want to oversimplify it, but you got, I mean, all of our listeners, I hope the light bulb's going off on this. Like, whether you're, maybe you're in Key West right now, or maybe you're in San Jose or wherever you're at, you're, you should be thinking, like, I think I could do that. Yeah. No, I mean, anybody can do it. And, and then it even comes down to, well, how do I get the check? You know, well, you have, you have your attorney or whoever closed that deal, mail it to the bank and they're going to deposit it. There's no signature needed on it. If you can't, if you can't set up a wire or something like that. So then that's how you can get paid. But I, I think part of that because I like to wire, but nowadays with wire fraud, some of the settlement agents are not accepting wires or doing wires. So right. You, so you just mail it to the bank. You just mail it to like the manager there or something, or how do you do it? Just to the like in it'll have your name on it right. um, with the bank's name, and when they get a check, they they'll just put it in. They mm -hmm. you don't need a signature. They don't call you. It's it's pretty straightforward. I and that. It's been a way of depositing check for years that I think people just didn't realize was a possibility. But that works out great too. Um, when I would get commission checks at a certain point, my brokerage wasn't doing direct deposits. Same deal. They would just mail them to the bank. And it, it takes a little longer to get your money, but it's not, uh, it doesn't, you don't have to have anyone running around trying to figure out how to get get you paid but isn't it kind of nice like when you're on the road and you're creating deal flow and then all of a sudden checks just drop into your checking account yeah it's amazing <laughs> i bet it and is especially when you're like putting all this together by the pool or at the beach you know like i have my laptop that i go everywhere with i have a global hot spot that's with me always that works in hundreds of countries mm -hmm. So I always have access to internet and I literally can do deals from anywhere. What global hotspot do you like? It's, it's called Glocal Me. Uh, and, I, and I bought it on Amazon. Of course, right? Yeah. It's where and it's Amazon will deliver like, anywhere, won't they? Will they deliver to an RV? Uh, they'll deliver to an RV park. There you go. So you just have to make sure like you know where you're going to be a couple of days from now because I did get Amazon delivered on the road, of course, mm -hmm. and uh, just send it ahead of time to the RV park on Prime, you know, two days. And 90% of the time, they'll just hold it for you until you get there. Um, we had to buy some like parts for RV, you know, there's RV repairs and stuff. So we had stuff shipped ahead of us uh, a couple of different times. Awesome. Yeah. All right. So now you're back from your 12 month and, and you're, you're putting together this six month travel plan. Yeah. Interna international, right? In 2018. Yep. The end of 2018 through 2019. I've only been back a month. Yep. Um, and I kind of, so once the deals started coming in and I was starting to make good money on the road in the RV, I, I've always wanted to do more uh, traveling abroad. So I really kind of started conspiring this plan of going abroad um, while on the RV trip. So I think I booked my ticket to New Zealand like before I even got back from my RV trip. <laughs> I, knew I, I knew I wanted to give myself a couple months at home to try and buy another rental property and get some things in place and just see family and friends. Um, but then, yeah, December, uh, be very beginning of December, 2018, I shot out to New Zealand. Um, and that's where I started my six months journey. So when you're managing your rental property abroad or on the road like that, do you have any tips for anybody that would like to be a mobile landlord like that? Yeah, it, it can be challenging. I, the biggest thing contractors can take care of things. I think the most, usually my 
I've been pl replacing appliances a lot, you know, having an appliance guy who can go out troubleshoot or get you a new a newer used fridge or something like that. A plumber and electrician who you can call all my tenants. I tell them I'm out of town for work. I don't give them any more specifics than that. Um, and you know, for the most part, I haven't had anything that was like major, major where they couldn't get a hold of me. I have a T-Mobile um, international plan, so I have data and cell service everywhere. They're able to call my U.S. number and get a hold of me pretty much anywhere I'm at. So, How do they pay rent? Uh, so they pay rent by all of them. One of them's direct deposit, and the others are they just go to the bank and put it right into my bank account. Yep, I do the same. I also hey, I use Buildium personally. Buildium is a really good platform. They can okay. just pay online. <clears throat> I like I, that. And I've heard good things about that. I think I want to start automating um, the next, you know, I'm, I'm looking to buy a bunch while I'm in town the next five months. And I think I want to systemize and build that up a little bit better so things are more automated like that. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good deal. The other thing is just, you know, um, well, as long as you've got someone who can go out there in an emergency, it works out pretty well. I have lock boxes at every house yep. with keys so that if I have to get a new contractor out there for something that is unforeseen, he's got access to the house. And um, also just um, the guy that I work with, Mitch, who will go out and meet with sellers, he has keys to my properties. He's got checks to pay contractors if need be. He could let someone into a house too if we need to get something done. As Excellent. Well. All right, so now you're ready to go to New Zealand. You booked it before you even came back. Do you have any um, travel hacks for saving money on flights and rooms and stuff? Absolutely. I would say the biggest thing is getting travel rewards credit cards. Yeah. That's huge. Um, I haven't paid for a flight in probably two years. Mm -hmm. And I just, in the past six months, I flew 11 times wow. it, to, to the other side of the world and back as well. So I have been really strategic with building points on travel credit cards, doing it, any LLCs that I have, rentals, major renter mm -hmm. rentals, making sure all my cards are paying me and as much points as possible. What cards do you like to maximize your rewards? The, my favorite is Chase Sapphire Reserve. Everybody talks about that one. <laughs> well, it pays so much. The bonus gets you like, you know, you spend so many thousand dollars within the first three months, you're gonna get about $800 in free travel right out the gate. It, you get uh, access to 1200 airport lounges all over the US that has free Wi-Fi, free food, free alcohol, just hang out in the lounges. That's like a beautiful thing. That comes free with the travel card. Um, and then get three X points on travel and restaurants. Huh. So you build points really fast. Excellent, so Chase Sapphire. My daughter Crystal loves that card as well. And she's um, always loving to travel, so I'm not surprised you said Chase Sapphire. I don't have one, so I guess I better check into it. Yeah, absolutely. Got to get the reserve and not the preferred. Uh, the reserve accrues way more points. It's a higher annual fee, but you'll get a credit at the same time um, that brings your annual fee down. It's worth the, it's worth paying the extra annual fee for the extra benefits. How about travel hacks for um, lodging? I know you can stay in hostels. I see him. My nephew Michael loves hostels, by the way. But you know, us older guys older. We can always stay in hostels with, with our wives and kids. Do you have any lodging tips? Yeah, um, I would say that the biggest thing is uh, just looking for, if you're, if you're not looking to stay in hostels, um, you can also, the thing about hostels is they, a lot of times they have private rooms as well. So like if you're solo traveling, you can get a private room. That's not, that's more, uh, a little bit more pricey, but it's still going to save you a lot of money. And you're going to get that interaction with the guests that yeah. you want to typically hotel. Mm -hmm. On that, I would say using like 
booking.com is a really good way to find some cheap hotels. Um, they, I've been able to find hotels as cheap as, um, you know, private rooms and hostels, especially in places like Asia. I think I've paid for a regular hotel room. I have paid as cheap as like $11 a night wow. uh, in Thailand. So yeah. And Hostel World is the app that I use for when I'm looking for hostels to stay in. That's a, that's a really big one. Um, What's the name of the app? Hostel World. Got it. And booking, uh, booking.com, they have an app as well where they have hotels as well. And the more you use them, you can earn credits for uh, free rooms. Excellent. All right. So now you're, you're taking off to New Zealand. That's a long flight. Very. Um, it's, I have not been to New Zealand or Australia. I need to go. So like, what was your flight path to get to New Zealand? Yeah, so I flew out to LAX, to Los Angeles, so uh -huh. about five and a half, six hours cross country. I had an eight-hour layover, uh, and then from there, I took an overnight flight uh, direct to Auckland, New Zealand, uh, uh -huh. which was 18 hours. 18 hours. Yeah. I did not know planes went that far without refueling. <laughs> yeah, no, you're, you know what? I think it was... What I'm thinking is total, so it was like 13 and a half hours. Okay. Um, yeah, so six hours across and 13 and a half. Gotcha. But they, so, do have, do, they do have direct flights that are that long. It's crazy. Wow, amazing. So, I mean, I've also been to China like yourself, so I know the flight from like Dallas to Tokyo is 14 hours. It's long. It's crazy long. So when you got to Auckland, then um, did you know exactly what you were going to do in New Zealand? It's a beautiful place. Yeah, I had. So uh, at the beginning of my trip, my mom has always wanted to go to New Zealand. So I, I, I took her. I said, you know what? Since you want to go to New Zealand, I'll start my six month trip there. We can do t two weeks together. And nice. then she flew back. She had to get back to work. So she flew back to uh, the States and um, so what I had done was planned out everything. We had a rental car, we had an Airbnb because we had two weeks to work with. Right. So we did some sailing in the Bay of Islands and we did blackwater rafting through the glowworm caves and we went to Hobbiton and we saw a lot of the countryside and the beaches and everything. And after that, after those two weeks, she flew home and then I went into my normal mode of travel, which is plan <laughs> like a day or two at a time. Like I will literally be needing to check out the hostel tomorrow. And people were like, where are you going? I'm like, I don't know yet. Uh, <laughs> where have you been? What's, what's good? Where should I go? I like keeping it loose because you're constantly making new friends and meet, you know, you'll travel with them or they'll come along with you. And if you have things too booked out, you plan too much, you're going to shut yourself off from those opportunities that present themselves. That's a great tip. So when you were in New Zealand and getting around, were you, were you still doing some real estate deals? Yeah, absolutely. So when I went to New Zealand, what I had set up before I left, um, because the time difference is so drastic, it it's is. 18 hours ahead, wow. I knew that I wasn't going to be able to be in contact in the states like I was when I was in the US as far as people need a document from me now we got a closing today or this or that so I was still working on wholesales as they come in doing the best I could there but what I did for the agent side of things was we trained another agent in my office to take my spot while I was gone uh, working the digital paperwork side of things and so then everything went on referral. So they would still work the deals, close deals 100% without me, and I would still get a paycheck, um, although it's not as big as if I was in it working. Sure. Um, but I was, they're closing deals at home. They don't need anything from me, and I'm still getting some income from that. Excellent. So where'd you go after New Zealand? So after New Zealand, I went to Australia. Beautiful. Then uh, Indonesia, uh, wow. Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, 
Japan and then China. Mm -hmm. uh, I flew from China to Miami and then we That's went. where we met. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing cruise to Cuba. We got in and out just in time. We did. I liked Cuba, did you? Oh, it was awesome. It's the like people were great. I just feel really bad. They're so oppressed. And I'm glad we got in when we did. I agree. I, it was really good to see see Cuba and it's just a very unique place. It is. All right, so out of the places you've been internationally, which were the top couple that you've been to that you really liked and you'd go back if you could? Yeah, New Zealand is just amazing. Um, everything there's worth seeing. I was there for seven weeks and I feel like I could go back again and wow. see a whole different side of New Zealand. Um, the, uh, the other one that really sticks out in my mind is um, – Indonesia, Bali. Bali looks beautiful in the pictures. I have not been there either. It's gorgeous. And the prices are really low. The U.S. dollar is strong. You can live like a king there for little money. Um, I would say average hostels are 8 to, I don't know, probably 8 to $10 a night. And... Um, I met a lot of Americans there as well who were digital nomads and working from abroad who were renting out villas by the pool for wow. four to six hundred dollars a month. Wow. So, yeah, it's like having that stronger U.S. dollar and cheaper prices and being, being able to make U.S. dollars from the road, you can really live, live it up and in a different location. So mm -hmm. Bali was great. All right, and I know you've not had very many um, security issues or challenges that way while you were abroad, but I've been to China, you've been to China, and something happened in China on your way out. Do you want to share that last story, and then we'll finish up with a little real estate? Yeah, yeah. Well, it was um, an interesting story. I have made it through my whole trip without really any issues. And I decided that I was going to go out all night with some friends because I wanted to stay up all night so that when I got on my, I think, 15-hour uh, yeah. flight back from China, that I was just going to conk out on the flight and wake up in the States. So the game plan was to go out all night. So we did. We did that. We went out to some clubs and had a good time. We, we stayed out all night long. We got picked up. I'm in a taxi, me and a buddy from Argentina, and um, we noticed that the meter, on the meter, it, it cost us 40 yen to get there, to get there on our way to the, to the club earlier. On the it's way like, in, yeah. Yeah, it's, so we knew what about the cost was to get back home, and in China, no one really speaks much English at all. Uh, I agree with you on that. The language barrier is very, very challenging. Uh -huh. So he picked us up, and I think he saw uh, us, a couple of Americans. He was going to make a couple extra bucks. And it, we uh, had only left. We had only been gone for, like, maybe two minutes down the road, and the meter was already saying, like, 40, 45 yen. So we knew something was up. So my buddy's telling him, like, hey, man, what's the deal? You know, like, why is it, why is it so expensive? And the driver's getting all upset. And he's like, I'll take it off. I'll take the meter off, you know. And you pay me a hundred yen. And we're mm. like, no, we're not paying that. You know, that's like more than double the cost of it, how much it should take to get back. So long story short, we finally get the hostel. We go to get out and he's got the doors are locked so that we can't get out of the back. <laughs> <laughs> he had the child locked in on us. We're locked in a taxi abroad. It sounds like a whole new uh, ID channels uh, series. Yeah. Yeah, so a good thing to note is when you get in a taxi, just try and open the door right away to make sure you can get back out. So we got in a big argument with him over, over the, the amount that we were supposed to pay. We said, all right, take us to the police. We're not paying 100 yen. So he drove us down the way a couple blocks. We, uh, w my buddy's just getting really heated at this point over it. Then he reduces his price to 50 yen. My buddy's still not, he's not wanting to pay this 10 extra again it's going to cost, which is really like $1.25 is what we're <laughs> arguing over. It's not a big deal. It's just the point this guy's trying to take advantage of. 
So it's, it, you know, he, they're yelling at each other. And I'm like, look, I am literally going to fly out of the country to go home in three hours. Um, and here's the extra 10 yen. We get out, we make it back to our hostel and uh, I make it to Shanghai and get on home, get fly back out to Miami. Unreal. But other than that, we, you know, I really didn't have any sketchy situations. Um, I've always felt very safe in the places I've been and hadn't had any issues, but this guy was just trying to make a extra 50 yen that day. And you got a little bit. Yeah, I hear you. Next time, take a rickshaw where you can just jump out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's a good one. Good advice. Awesome. There you go. So um, just in closing, uh, do you have any final tips on, I guess, finding an entrepreneurial path, whether it's through real estate or whatever, where you could really carve out the life that you want, total freedom, like a blank sheet of paper, figure out what you want to do and go do it. You, yeah. you had no fear doing that, but other people struggle with that. Do you have any tips? I think the biggest thing is just start while you're still working, you know, like get, start buying a couple rental properties. Folk, if you really want to do what I'm doing, you need to focus on the most passive income possible. You know, wholesaling is good when you can make them make the deals um, go through. You still have to actively work at it. And if you have time on the road, that's doable. But if you can get some rental properties where you're cash flowing every month and the money's just coming in, whether you do anything or not, that's, that's very helpful. Also, you know, if you have your real estate license, doing referrals or sponsoring other agents into your office, all those are very passive ways of creating income. Um, I'm also in, you know, another way you could build income is like, starting a blog about your travels or something, which I've done, which will be another uh, source of income for me. So just focusing on the most passive income strategies in real estate, do it, get stuff in motion while you're still working. And then as that money starts to build, just reducing your costs um, so that you can hit the road. Is your travel blog live now? Yeah, absolutely. What's, what website is it? It's businessandabackpack.com. I love it. Businessandabackpack.com with Ryan Mellon. Ryan, I love travel, and I love the way that you've really carved out a very unique path while supporting. It's like you use real estate to support your lifestyle in ways that I haven't seen other people do. So congratulations. Well, thanks, man. I appreciate it. It's really been awesome. I look forward to uh, come December, getting back out and going back out to Asia, doing some different countries and just uh, doing a bunch of deals and building up some more passive income these next few months while I'm home. Love it. I hope Cheryl and I can see you while you're around this summer. And I really appreciate your being my guest today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Jim. I appreciate you. All right, I hope everyone took a lot of notes. If you like this show, leave me a comment right now, like on a scale of one to 10, how did you like this? 10 being it was amazing and I wanna live Ryan's life, you know? Um, if you picked up some tips, share those tips with somebody, because pass it on, the more you give, the more you receive. Thanks to all of our listeners, you guys are awesome. We appreciate all the shares, comments, likes, and reactions. Have a great day, everybody.